So Dave, our topic today, I think is gonna be kind of an extension of what you've mentioned a little bit already, and that is the invisible secret keeping you single. So first of all, tell us what you mean by that and what the invisible secret is that's keeping many people single. Right, well, I, you know, I did kind of mention it, but it is uh, understanding that they have their own unique individual uh, un undiscovered blocks that are hiding to the get in the way that prevent them from having the love that they want. It's based on unresolved wounds and past history, uh, things that have come up, um, assumptions that they've made, stories they've told themselves, uh, beliefs that they've taken on. And those things are just you know, absolutely um, sabotaging when they come up and things that they, they have taken on, um, habitual patterns that they run. Uh, so, it, what I love about the podcast is again, I'm talking to these people that I don't really know them, but I'm as I'm asking them questions, I start to um, I start to pull out their their uh, their patterns that they run, and start to show them how this is absolutely sabotaging behavior, and so it's really profound and powerful. Some of the breakthroughs that have come from that when people start to see it, because if you know if you don't see it, you can't heal it. And so I, I, I want to bring it into view so that people can see it, understand it, understand the cost of it, and then understand, well, how do, what do I do instead? And so then I kind of game plan with them and they see the problem, see the solution, and I start to put it together. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's so important because so much of this stuff kind of like operates underneath the surface, right? And we can't really manage it or or have breakthroughs without understanding, or at least knowing on some level what's going on there, right? Absolutely, yeah. I, you know, I talk about the fact that you know usually these these things that are hiding in plain sight, they're unknown, they're unowned, and they're unresolved. Absolutely. So they're sitting there, uh, just festering, kind of underneath the surface. And but you know what I hope people understand again, especially in the podcast and in my in my coaching one on one, you know, it's not an accident when people with rejection and abandonment issues somehow end up with people who are one day going to reject and abandon them. It's not dumb luck. It is not happenstance when you know people that don't know their own value are going to somehow maybe get with someone who seems like they really are crazy about them. And then all of a sudden they know they fail to acknowledge their value after a while. And again, because it's an unresolved wound, it's like, so there's things that you're doing that are creating it. And, and it, it's usually not that way in the beginning. It usually shifts over time. Because again, like I said, it's it's invisible. You don't know that you're doing, you don't know you're running these patterns. You, you don't know how to respond if some things do start to shift, you know? Uh, you know, it's not uh, unexpected when, you know, um, people that, uh, like I said, have abandonment issues or um, people who don't trust themselves will end up with people that absolutely shouldn't be trusted in the first place too. So it's that, those types of things, they, you know, abandonment, rejection, uh, trust issues, not knowing your value issues. Those are the kinds of things that I just find that pop up again and again. And the interesting thing too, uh, is if it shows up in a million ways, you know, like for instance, you know, um, abandonment, can look a million different ways, you know, they don't, and they don't put it together. So, oh, the other thing too, as I talk about is like, you're the one unique, unique thing in common with every man you've dated. These men presumably don't really know one another. You're the one unique thing. And, but if, if the, you know, there's a million different ways you can, for instance, be abandoned, like abandoned could be, you know, someone ghosts you, someone doesn't call you, someone breaks up with you, someone goes to jail, someone goes into military service, someone dies, someone like, again, there's a million different ways that it'll look, but you don't necessarily put it together and say, oh, what do these have in common? Mm -hmm. I was abandoned. And so, you know, there are a million ways. And, and that's why people, I think, don't necessarily see it. They don't connect the dots. Uh, and I think that's what's really beautiful and helpful is when you connect the dots and you see it, uh, then you can start to do things differently and when you do things differently, you receive things differently. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a really good point that the issue might be abandonment, but it might present in a variety of different ways, a variety of different scenarios. And so that might be a little harder to connect the dots if you're not aware of that. Right, right. And then and I put out a book also, and that's really what the book is basically did. I was a bunch of exercise in it. And the book is called uh, Same Shit, Different Date. You know, it's based on that little saying, like, same stuff, different day. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's about the different dates, people that you date, 
uh, and it, you st- keep having the same results essentially. And so it basically is a deep dive in all these exercises. You figure out, well, what are, what are the, the commonalities? What keeps happening? What's, what are the stories that I'm repeating? What are the stories I'm not seeing entirely? Uh, so it's, it's pretty profound uh, a game changer when people start to, to see it and realize that like, oh, the reason that keeps happening is because of this. And in order to, to fix that, we'd have to do this differently. So it really is pretty specific. Once you see the issue, you know how to shift it. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's right. That's the beginning of a, a major, well, it's a breakthrough. It's a breakthrough. That awareness oh, okay. in and of itself is a breakthrough. Yeah. Well, I would I would describe it as literally the, you know, the process of accruing wisdom. I mean, you have experience over time. Uh, you know, the, the problem is in between wisdom is, uh, you know, a lot of times people have an experience and then they'll say, oh, like somebody said recently on a blog that I was answering, um, uh, why am I never good enough? I'm like, well, the reason you're never good enough is because you asked that specific question which has no basis in fact. And you'll ask that question in a million different ways. You know, I said, you know, you, you, uh, you'll you talk about why am I not good enough because your, you know, your relationship ended or, you know, you didn't get the job you wanted or the promotion you wanted, or, you know, you didn't make the finals of America's Got Talent. You know, you'll ask that question in a million different contexts, but you'll, and you'll always get to it. Why am I not good enough? And like, these are the things that, you know, again, we hone in on that statement and you kind of blow it up so that you can't get to it anymore. Um, and it's really powerful and profound. I mean, if you actually, uh, if you actually got rid of that belief, like that, you, I'm absolutely good enough, and I'm actually glad that I found this out now. Like something like that, that is a game changer. That that changes everything when you don't get to that place anymore. Uh, mm-hmm. You start, you stop making things about you, and you start to understand that the, there's a, there's a, a. a kind of a divine beauty in the world and everything that, you know, you're going to get and attract exactly what you need to heal the wounds that you don't know you have. And, and again, that's the other thing I talk about in the podcast. It's not happening to torture you. This is happening to teach you. You just haven't gotten the lesson yet. And, and you think, you think you're trying to heal the wrong lesson. You think you're trying well, what do I have to do to fix me? No, no, no. That's not the, that's not the question. You're asking the wrong question. You'll get the wrong answer again and again and again. So, you know, and then you'll just get it again, you know, somehow or another, you'll fix the one thing. And then, you know, you might get abandoned for another entirely different reason that actually has nothing to do with you. Like, for instance, you know, if someone dies, uh, again, that's nothing to do with you not being good enough, obviously, but the, the experience is the same, you know, for the, for the receiver, the one who's left. So, but there's, there's no basis, in fact, that the person died because you weren't good enough. Uh, these two things have no relation, uh, no connection, no reality. So it's powerful and profound when people start to understand their patterns and their, their invisible wounds that uh, continue to sabotage them in real time. Yes, it is very, very powerful, very powerful. Because then people get to be in choice about whether or not they continue to have that pattern of belief. They can They can begin to work with it instead of just letting it run the show. Absolutely. And, and run the show unconsciously too. Right. It, exactly. It makes it like, you know, kind of a bull in a China shop It's very unpredictable and you don't know what's going to happen next. And, and that's painful, you know, when you're in the middle of that thing and, you know, like people are spiraling, you know, in like after a breakup and they're, they're asking that terrible question, like what's wrong with me? Why, why, why does no one ever love me? Like, uh, I mean, that, that takes you in, just terrible directions that, as I believe, don't really have a basis. In fact, I mean, I, everyone is inherently lovable in their way. And maybe you just haven't met the person who is the right match for you, you know? So, and I think sometimes it's actually a beautiful blessing when a relationship that you're in doesn't work because you're really not compatible. You know, some people get too invested in, oh, I got to make this one the one. Maybe they're just not, you know, and maybe it took some time to learn that. So, um, it is actually a blessing, you know, not a curse that it didn't work out with that one because there's someone better for you on the other side of it. And once you heal your stuff and you start to show up in a, in a beautiful empowered way that a lot of our clients, you know, get to after they do the work and they stop asking such terrible questions, like what's wrong with me? And why, why, why haven't I found love yet again, which is the name of my podcast. It's specifically why I named it that because you know I'm hoping the people that ask that question will find it, you know, 
Yeah. Learn to ask yes. better questions. Yeah, well, and that's so important. A couple of things you said there that really stand out. One is it often is a blessing when something doesn't work out, even if we don't see it that way at the t- at the moment in the time. And that sometimes if there's such a struggle to try to make this one the one, that might be indicative that they're really not the one. Right. And, and then um, how powerful it is to watch not only our thoughts, but the way we're phrasing the questions that we're asking ourselves. I mean, obviously, our thoughts are incredibly powerful, and that includes the questions we're asking ourselves. So if we're asking this question in that way, therein lies the, the rub right there, right? That's the way our mind is thinking, the way that we're the way we're asking that question is indicative of our mindset, whether we're conscious of it or not. Right. And especially if you're not conscious, but you're also thoughts are things and you're, you're creating it in real time as you believe. So you receive, if you believe you're unlovable, you're, you're putting out into the universe, show me someone who believes I'm, un, I'm unlovable. Let me, Oh, I didn't quite get it. Let me, I'm not lovable. Show me someone else who believes I'm unlovable. Show me someone else. And you'll keep having that response but again, you're the author of the idea. You're the author of the thought. You're putting it out there. You know, um, thoughts are things. You put them out there and you can't be surprised when they showed up. You know, when they show up, you're creating your experience to a, to a huge degree. You know, if you love yourself, but like, I think the really sweet spot is when you can say, you know what, uh, I'm an amazing soul on a good day. And then some days I'm in a hot mess and every day in between, I'm still pretty amazing. Like if you can actually embrace the hot mess aspect of you or the, you know, that part that's not perfect and, and, you know, get out of the need to be perfect club. I think that amazing things happen when you get there and you can embrace all of you. And it's, it's about, you know, parts integration, understanding and loving everything about you. The, the, the aspects that you think are genuinely amazing and the parts that are like, Oh, I wish I had that one back or that wasn't like the best day or I wish I had done that differently that stuff. And, but th- again, that's a, that's a much better spin on oh, why does this always happen to me? What's the matter with me? Why am I not lovable to, yeah, that wasn't my best moment. I wish I had that one back and I would do that totally differently next time. Same incident, totally different story. You know, your story, uh, you know, the story creates the reality, even if it's not real. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in fact, and you and I were talking uh, briefly before we started the interview about one of your episodes where you were working with a woman who had this pattern of taking on men more or less as fixer-upper projects, right? Absolutely. Um, And yeah, and, and you know, she understood that, you know, she had a a father who was very afraid of of men getting too close to her, and he, he really like he made her very much ashamed. She's actually a really uh, a sensual woman who desires romance in her life. Her better her dad, because of, you know, beliefs and religions uh, issues, things that he, he made her feel afraid of men, that they were always out to get her and that there was something bad was going to happen. You need to stay away from them. They're nothing but trouble. And, you know, she had all these beliefs were running in the show. And again, so her beliefs underneath it, that they were installed, by dad is that you know men are not trustworthy men are this men are that you know and it, it was really absolutely unworkable and she kept you know getting into relationships with with men who would basically bear out some of her greatest fears you know um so it it's she started with the the, the belief and the belief found her in in the in human form essentially she was finding wounded men, men who had their own wounds and their own issues. Right. Men who were actually attracted to her sensuality and they would sort of uh, like she desired them. They desired her and they would talk her into a deal that wasn't in her best interest. And she would think, oh, well, he'll change his mind once I, once I give him what he want. And that wasn't the case, you know, because mm-hmm. again, she didn't value herself. She didn't trust men she didn't believe that a man would stay she believed that men would you know act in ways that were you know not really um in integrity and things like that so again it just happened again and again and again and she would make little deals with herself like she'd say well 
you know, I, I don't, I don't want to sleep with them, but maybe just this once or something like that. Like, and it's a slippery slope, you know, um, cause she had needs as well and no one's making that wrong, but there's, there's ways to, to navigate that. But when she started to understand that she seeks out these projects again and again and again, cause she has this belief that men need to be fixed. So she keeps attracting men need to be fixed and then she fixes them and then they move on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so make, make some progress anyway, shall we say? Um, but yeah, she'd she'd experienced it again and again and again, and you know, until she does something different, you know, she'll keep getting what she believes she's going to get or what she's worth. Mm -hmm. so, you know, we're going pretty deep today. It's deeper than we've ever gone, I think. On this, yeah, yeah, we are going pretty deep, and I think it's uh, I think it's so powerful, Dave, because both you and I know from the work that we do, like you said earlier, if you've had a pattern of relationships that haven't worked out repeatedly, you are the common denominator. And sometimes that's kind of hard to hear. And sometimes that's kind of hard to take in. And yet it can be the gateway to opening up a whole new set of possibilities for you because, because you are the common denominator and if there have been patterns that have not worked in your favor in terms of relationships, that also means that you have the power to discover something important that can help you to shift something where you can start getting better and different kinds of results. So it's actually an empowering message, even though the initial piece may be a little bit of a bitter pill to swallow when you say, oh boy, I'm the common denominator. And I understand that because that was my own story. I mean, I struggled for many, many years. I used to say I was going to write a book called Dating for Decades, chronicling all my dating <laughs> adventures and misadventures over <laughs> multiple decades. Um, and, and then it was, it was sobering when I got to that point to realize I was the common denominator. And in my case, there were definitely some limiting beliefs and some behavior patterns that were not supporting me to have the kind of relationship that I wanted. It wasn't until I got to that point that I could see what they are and I had to get support to do that. Right. I was able to be in choice about it, to make different decisions, to make different choices that led to better results. And ultimately me meeting my amazing husband, who I've now been married to for about 15 years. That's awesome. Yeah. So I, I have lived this, what we're talking about, which is one of the reasons that I feel like it's so important and so profound um, you know, and I've now had the privilege also of supporting and working with many, many women on their own journeys as you have. And so this just totally resonates with me because it is the thing that made it possible for me to meet and marry my husband. I wouldn't have met him if I hadn't have done this work we're talking about. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that too and added that whole piece like it can be a bitter pill at first, but like, I don't think any, there's not a lot of good in the world that comes from guilt and shame. Uh, so if you can let that side go for just take a breath, let that go, go past. And you know, what's really great about this news, even though you're the common denominator, the, the, what's beautiful about that is that you are the one thing that you can change like that. Nothing else has to happen. It's really hard. I can tell you as a coach, it's really hard to change other people, especially people that don't think there's a problem and don't want to change. But if you see it and you're like, if you get, get rid of gate, uh, guilt and shame about it and just say, wait a minute, the great news is this is the thing that I do. I can just change my mind, change my habits, change of belief, no pushback. And I can literally change my results. And so I think that's actually a really good thing when you get away the guilt and shame, you know, uh, and in the story that I told too about the, the person who said, you know, what's the matter with me? Why don't I, why can't, why am I always not lovable? Like I had a version of that too. And I was single much longer than I ever thought after my divorce too, which how I got started in this work too, because I knew I needed to learn a better way. Right. Um, and, and my version on it was something like, ah, it's never enough. You know, I can never do enough. And it was, I mean, that's the product of a, you know, a mom who could be a little bit critical sometimes and, and like it's frustrating trying to, you know, hit the bar, you know, or clear the bar. And, you know, it's a lot of work too, um, to understand it and understand how it used to hold me back. I don't mm -hmm. feel that way anymore. Now, when I hear someone else say it, I'm like, ooh, I, I, I know where this goes. 
I have a good idea of this. So um, it, there's nothing better than a being able to help someone say, hey, look, you know what? Here's the thing right here. If you just fix this right here, like if you're the mechanic and you hear, you hear a car running and you say, I know your problem. It's right here. You know, I think that's, um, that's the beauty of it, you know, to be so attuned that you, you can actually, you know, elegantly, effectively, and efficiently get to the root of the problem. And when I call the root, the um, relationship origin of trauma, like this is where it started. That's the root. And if we pull the root out and we heal that, it's not there anymore. But if you only pick the top off and the root stays, then it continues to happen again and again. So it's really important to understand the root. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, as I said, Dave, I really uh, totally resonate with this approach and what you're doing because I know it works because it's what made it possible for me to get out of that that cycle, whatever we want to call it, the tread, the, the little treadmill of the, 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 the same, 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 same. Ground we could call it dating for decades, I think. Huh? We could call it dating for decades. Yeah. <laughs> the name of the, the fourth time book. Cycle. <laughs> <laughs> and actually into a great relationship. So I know that it works and um, I really resonate with the kind of work that you're doing in the world and um, uh, appreciate you sharing some of your thoughts and experiences and also some experiences from some of the people you've spoken with and worked with too. Because I think it's helpful for people just to kind of hear these kinds of things and realize they're not alone. A hundred percent. Again, when you realize you're not alone, again, I think that's really important to take away some of that guilt and shame. People are, you know, we're our own worst critics, uh, typically, you know, um, <laughs> And I think on the other side of that, there's a there's a peaceful place where you could just address it. You can understand it. You can heal it. You pull it away just a little bit, enough distance to see it, see it for what it is, see it for what it wasn't, see it for what it doesn't need to be anymore. And, and it's easier to look at it from a distance and just see it and understand that it actually quite honestly served you too. You know, people who think, you know, why am I never enough? Oh my God. Well, that's why these women who were on this uh, event listening to us, they're amazing women who are, are, you know, empowered in so many ways. They're amazing in their careers. They're incredible mothers, uh, you know, wonderful neighbors, great members in their family, uh, powerful members in the community. They do amazing things in every other area. This tends to be the one area they suffer because again, they, they just don't see the, the thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, I guess, our blessing to help them see it and then watch them grow past it and then do amazing things. So that's that's incredible. What a blessing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I really love that you said that because I think we all deserve our own compassion in this experience as well. Because when we remember that this desire for love, to have love, is one of the deepest human desires for most people, and so that's one of the reasons why we sometimes uh, go at it with, you know, so much awkwardness and that sort of thing, because it's such a drive. You know, like when I have looked back on my own love life and all of the different ways I shot myself in the foot, and I kind of want to go, oh, 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 how come I did that? Or I look back on some of these men that I dated and think, what in the world was I thinking? You know, I can also, you know, after I kind of get past that, ooh, ooh, ooh. I kind of go, wait a second, I deserve my own compassion. I was doing the best I knew at the time. Right. And I was being driven by a very, very deep desire to have love and partnership in my life. And that was something that was very, very important to me. And so right. I was going about it in the best way I knew how at the time. And so if we remember to look at ourselves through those eyes of compassion, and like right. you said, release the guilt and the shame. And I can now look back at myself during the dating for decades period through the eyes of compassion and say, you know what? You know, she was doing the best she could at that time. Yeah, you know, she absolutely. She didn't have the understanding or knowledge of what was really going on and what was operating underneath the surface that was causing these difficulties. And until I did... I, I couldn't have those breakthroughs that made it possible for me to move forward and powerfully and um, elegantly, as you said, in this area of life. And so that's the 
blessing and the privilege, I guess, of the work that we're doing and also in remembering to view yourself, no matter how many struggles or challenges or real or perceived mistakes you feel like you've made through those eyes of compassion. Yeah. And look, I think, it, it, you know, at the end of your life, the worst thing anyone can say about you is she, want, she wanted to have, be, and create more love in the world, then I, I would take that. That's a pretty good deal. If that's the worst thing someone can say about me, <laughs> uh, you know what? Mission accomplished and, I'm, you know, I'm done. I'll take it. That's a pretty good um, legacy to leave. Yeah. Dave, I always like to um, just give you an opportunity if there's a last parting thought or a last bit of wisdom or advice or encouragement or whatever that you'd like to leave us with, that would be great. Well, I, the first thing that comes to mind, I guess, because of what we've been talking about so far is I hope that people will take from this that, you know, you're amazing right now to, to be where you are at this moment in time. And uh, there are so many great things about you. Uh, and if you, like I say to my clients all the time, if you saw you the way I see you, like I, Here's a little secret as a coach's tip. You know, like I, this is one of the secrets that I tell my clients who are dating. Like I said, look, you, you got one job on this date. It's not to get a second date. It's not to say everything just perfectly. It's not to be perfect, not to look perfect. You have one perfect, or one, one job to do on this date. Your job is to just sit there, listen to them and say, what do I love about this guy? Like about this guy? Um, what's great about him? And then just throw back a, a few compliments and say, I really love the fact that you do that. Or that sounds really great. Or, wow, that's really a, a cool thing that you're doing and be specific. And look, I do the same thing when I'm talking to a client. What do I, what do I love about this person? What's great about them? And look, I focus on those things. And as I focus on those things, I get more of those things and I find more that I love. So if I'm doing that for them, they can do that for themselves. They can do it for others. And look, I think life is just better when you focus on what's great. You know, uh, and oh, and by the way, on the dating assignment, you don't have to see them again, but the job is you leave them better than you found them. That's the prime directive, essentially. And you can do that with a smile. You can do it with a compliment, as I'm suggesting. You can do it with just being a good soul and sharing, you know, a, a coffee for 30 minutes. You, It's easy to do. And you actually get up and walk away feeling better and the date will probably get up feeling better. So if you're going to give it to the people that you date, you give it to yourself. Say, what do you love about yourself? And uh, appreciate the, you know, no matter where you are right now, there's still some amazing qualities, some amazing traits that you already have. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes I call that looking for the gold, looking for the gold yeah. nuggets in someone else in ourselves and, um, you know, even if it's that he showed up on time and it looks like he combed his hair, there's always a little bit of gold that you can find, even if you're really, really struggling. Right. Absolutely. So. So and and approaching things from that way, um, you're going to get more. You're going to get more appreciation for people. You're going to have better dating experiences, which keeps you going, even if you're you know, needing to be out there dating for a while until you find the right connection. It makes the whole experience more enjoyable for you and for them. Right. And it's better than leaving the date and saying, oh, my God, he didn't go. He, he was late and he didn't show up. He didn't brush his hair or whatever, all those things. And that just feels bad. So you come away from it feeling down about dating, feeling down about your experience, down about the investment of your time. And I don't think that really helps anybody. You know, everybody kind of pays price for that, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dave. This has been great. It's been an enjoyable discussion and I think it'll be valuable for many people. We look forward to seeing you again. Bye for now.